Hey guys, let's get started here. We'll start off and first get our uh, other panelists in here as soon as we get going here. And uh, we have Jeff Smith in the queue. Let's see. So welcome, uh, give us a second. We'll get uh, fully up and running. There we go. Promote to panelist and we have there is uh, Greg Moody. Thank Thanks, you, Greg. Greg. And, uh, you know, one of my problems with these big ass monitors I have is I have to lean in to see them. Let's see. And there's Jeff Smith. I don't know if I've seen Bob Dunn, but um, there's Bob Dunn. So they should be joining us here. So. Let's get, uh, let's get rolling as quickly as we can. Uh, we have uh, quite a few people who registered, as usual. Uh, uh, a lot of martial artists are uh, unable to keep their calendar for whatever uh, strange reason. So, uh, you know, I'm sure a few are going to be trying to hope we do a, a, a recording and a replay. And I do think we're recording, so they may get a replay. But, um, um, Master Moody, why don't you start by introducing yourself and then ask, introduce Master Smith and, and uh, Mr. Dunn and let me get uh, our broadcast going smoothly and we'll get on a full roll here. Well, okay, great. My name is Greg Moody. I'm an eighth degree black belt. I've owned many schools, eight, eight schools in uh, Arizona and even in California area. So um, I've been uh, teaching uh, martial arts and being a full-time school owner and multi-school owner for many, many years. And I've also done a lot of seminars across the country. Recently, I've done a lot of uh, instructional seminars that probably a lot of our panelists have been on, on autism, bullying prevention, kind of well-known in the bullying prevention area. That's what I've got my PhD in, and uh, some of my academic background separate from what we've done in martial arts. So um, not to kind of go on from there, that's kind of some of my background. And uh, one thing that, you know, when we focus on martial arts schools is making sure the schools, regardless of all the instructional stuff and that stuff we want to make sure is super high quality, but that they're also very, very profitable. So that's something with my schools have always been, you know, kind of top of my list, very high instruction quality and very high profitability. So, um, uh, you know, I still own martial arts schools and uh, still do that day to day, but also work with um, lots of school owners here. Um, let me make sure that I don't take too much time and introduce Grandmaster Jeff Smith, 10th degree black belt. Grandmaster Smith, you want to let him know about yourself. <laughs> okay. I don't, I, I don't know how long to go. I don't know how long to go there, sir, but I want to make sure. I don't have enough time for me to say everything about me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, doing martial arts now for over 50 years, 10th degree black belt, uh, former first PKA World Light Heavyweight Champion in kickboxing. So uh, been around a long time. I was a senior vice president and, uh, you know, senior instructor at the uh, Grandmaster June Reed's organization for about 25 years. I started with him in 64. So uh, as you can see, 64 to now, I have quite a few years in there of running multi-schools and uh, working with Master Oliver for most of those years. Yeah, and, and uh, both you guys have worked together and been had very successful schools, not just in the June reorganization, but with your own schools together. I mean, own schools together and own schools uh, with world champion uh, karate as well. So uh, Grandmaster Smith is, you know, he probably could talk for the whole hour about all his accomplishments and everything. Um, one of the most highly recognized martial artists in the in the world that we've ever had, and I think you, you were really start of you really started a lot of the development of the of the business systems that are that what the top industry leaders use, um, and uh, uh, you know all the not just the uh, instructional systems, but you know the the funny part is is sometimes people think that when we teach stuff and we're we're teaching things about how to do people's business right. It comes from a point of view of just business, but really it's, everything's all together. Everything's all one and the same. Uh, Grandmaster Smith is the, trained all the world's best fighters. And at the same time, during all that time, the schools that he was working uh, and working and, and running were also all the best performing schools. So those things go together. And I just want to point that out. You know, when, when you hear Grandmaster Smith talk, it says a 10th degree black belt and world champion and 
and one of the best fighters in the world and train the best fighters in the world at the same time. But also at the same time, the schools were also the best performing schools in terms of financial returns and uh, income for the instructors and uh, quality of, of the students that weren't the world champion ones at the same time. So anyway, I just- And yeah. Bruce, and I, and I might add the schools but, too. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I might add to that because um, uh, really, if you look at what I did with my schools all the way back to 1983 and what Jeff Smith did in the Junior Institute back to the 70s and, and into the 80s and then with his schools is, Jeff Smith was not only in charge of all the instruction staff and the, and the uh, program director staff, him, but he was essentially the turnaround guy for, for the Junior Institute. So he was the guy who could go into a low performing school, make it the number one school, use that as a training facility, and then periodically roll to another one and roll to another one to pull it up. And I consciously or unconsciously picked up that model when I moved to Denver and so what I did, I opened five schools in 18 months, six schools in, in 30 months, which, by the way, is not a recommendation. It was a, you know, <laughs> and it, was, it was terribly underfunded, by the way, uh, all with about $10,000 in a pocket full of credit cards. But, the, um, but what I was going to say is my role started out as I did all, this, all, the, all the startups. So I would train staff, have them ready, add 100 students in the first month, add uh, two to 300 in the first 90, uh, uh, three to four months. And then I'd go to another school and turn it over to them, right? So I did, did one in August and did one in December, did one in July, did one in uh, October, and then did another one, um, I think it was July, uh, uh, a year later, uh, for a total of six. But really then what my role became, in addition to hiring and training staff and marketing with you know, with the requirement to do 120 new students every month. I mean, that was my threshold is that I needed to create 20 new students for every school, six schools, it was 120 a month with five schools, it was hundred a month. Um, but then my role became this the turnaround guy. So um, I would go in and whatever school was doing the worst, I'd put myself in there, take it to be our number one school by far, put somebody in there, usually with an implied or a literal threat of if you let it drop more than 10%, you know, your, your history. Um, and then go do it again periodically. And uh, uh, part of what was the reason I came upon that um, uh, logic, and I probably stole some of the thinking from Jeff Smith and uh, some of it from uh, Tom Peters. I always loved his books. But my, my logic was it eliminated all my staff's excuses. Because if I could pop myself in the worst one and make it by far the best one, they couldn't say, oh, it's that location. Now, what became their excuse is, oh, yeah, you can do it. Nobody else can do it. So somehow they ended up with like the Superman excuse. And so then I had to develop program directors who could do that. So put the top program director in the worst location, have them pull it up, incentivize them extra for, you know, the extra work and so forth. Hey, Mass Moody, you didn't uh, get to uh, uh, Bob Dunn here, I don't believe. Um, but this is Bob Dunn. He's been uh, working with uh, businesses and school owners just like yours. Uh, for what now, Bob? 15 years or something like that? I mean, something 18, like that. Yeah. I 18. Mean, it, yeah, a little further than that, it would go back to, uh, you know, free martial arts wealth mastery. So I've been boots on the ground talking with all walks of life of martial arts school owners for a long time. Yeah, sure. and, and uh, uh, the other three of us talk to a lot of school owners, but you talk to bunches of school owners you're 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 probably on a on a 10 to 1 ratio compared to us uh you, <laughs> even right now you, you probably are talking to 10 for everyone that uh, uh that we talk to so you're getting the whole gamut you're getting and, and by the way what's the number one failure um signal that you immediately recognize when somebody's on the phone what's what when, when you immediately say this guy is a loser <laughs> he's not going to make it what, what 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 do they say to you right away well there's a couple i mean the, the number one belief is that uh, marketing should be something that you do last. I mean, it's not one of the foremost things that uh, most school owners are focused on. They yeah. don't believe that uh, that is going to be the prime directive. And that's not an area that they put most or, or invest most of their time into, right? But yet, the flip side of the coin, the number one thing that all of them believe they need is another 100, 200 students, right? So it's always about attracting new students, which is you know, an oxymoron, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but uh, 
Uh, the other, I guess, uh, major challenge that I've, I've really identified is that almost everybody doesn't have a good handle on what their retention really looks like. Uh, everyone will believe that their school is doing, they never lose their students. But when you do the math and you work it out, uh, you can really, the math tells all. So you can really find out they're flipping the school over. Almost all of them are flipping the school over annually. Yeah, well, uh, let, 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 let me say it differently. They all say, oh, I'm a great instructor. My students love me. I don't need work with teaching. I don't need work on retention. I don't need work on any of that. I just need 10 more students a month. Or if I just had another 50 students, everything would be great. Is that is that right? And in reality, when we look at the numbers, instead of losing maybe 1% or 2% a month, which is our benchmark, they're usually losing 7 8 10% a month. Even, you know, the best ones are maybe at, at, at 5 or 6% a month. So they really, one, don't know what the benchmark should be for dropouts, and two, is mostly, you know, if, you, if you're only taking the word of those people who are your A-plus students who are in your face about how great you are, who are, you know, practically, um, um, you know, um, what would be the right word? Devotees, they're, uh, you know, they worship the ground. Yeah. They, they think that if they teach great classes and they're a great martial artist, that everybody will come and right. everybody will stay. And uh, that's what I found with uh, a lot of the world champions. Because I'm a world champion isn't why my schools and uh, the junior schools did well. It was because I focused on that. And, yeah. you know, that's your background too, Master Oliver. You know, uh, you came up through our junior organization and when you were – uh, you know, getting your degree at uh, Georgetown University in business, uh, you got a chance to put those business systems into application uh, from what you're learning in school and realize that, hey, those things don't work unless you have a business that you can fit them into and you learn that whole business system. And not only did you learn it, it was one of the top schools in the junior organization, you went out to Colorado and put it to the test and started from ground roots with just your credit cards to get them going. You didn't get your parents to give you your first uh, school or give you the money. You just use credit cards. And as soon as you got one up to speed, which was usually four to six weeks, you were opening the next one. So just between me and you. And By the way, it's not a recommendation. Don't do it the way I did. <laughs> yeah. Just between me and you running schools, uh, we have almost 100 years. And if we add in huh. Master Moody and uh, Bob Dunn, we got almost 150. And of course, I, I am going to say that 100 you. years, most of those were, most I had the majority of those. I had to get that in first, yes. <laughs> that, very good. But, you know, our, 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 our theme for today is the great comeback and it's time to thrive, not survive. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we want to make this uh, topical and relevant. Here's the uh, uh, cover of today's Wall Street Journal. And if you can see that, it says retail sales rebound by 17.7% .7 in May. If you aren't paying attention, in fact, most people are paying attention to the news, but all they're getting is the 95% that's bad and, uh, and not the, um, uh, the underlying reality is what happened in, in May from a, you know, and, and you, you said a business degree, but my, my degree at in, in, in Georgetown was international economics with a, a minor that I never got around to declaring in computer science. And then I got an MBA uh, uh, later. But if I put my economist hat on is what everybody thinks is, oh my God, you know, the economy is horrible. Everything is crashed. It's awful. And the reality is the numbers are already showing they're much better than anybody predicted. Um, you know, and all the talking heads on TV are mostly morons. Uh, you know, be very careful about, about paying attention to any of that. But this is a very unusual situation. Uh, you know, an economist from a standpoint of the stock market would call it a V-shaped recovery. And if you look at the Dow, the NASDAQ, everything else, it is exactly a, a V-shaped recovery. From a standpoint of the underlying economy is the excuse that people are using right now. And I want to go back to student retention because that's like the biggest sin that's happened in the last 90 days. But everybody's saying, oh, you know, we, I, 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 I made the mistake of reading, you know, I guess the one remaining industry trade magazine since I shut down the other one. But the, um, um, I, I ended up going through and reading that yesterday, reading their um, um, analysis of thriving during uh, COVID. And I was just shocked. I don't know, Master, if you've had a chance to, to see that. I, uh, I sent it to, uh, to, uh, to you and Master Smith, I think. Here's one of the, uh, 
uh, the, just the stupid um, uh, recommendations. Most of us are providing this service, meaning lessons, uh, while waiving or suspending our tuition fees because we know we are making a difference. That's good. And we're fortunate that our students look to us for guidance because we have a proper mindset to help them. Um, now, the underlying implication is, is all of your students are broke because the economy is crap. Well, if in fact the uh, unemployment in, in most of these areas hit 20%, I got to tell you, uh, it tends to be, as always, 20 to 30 year old males that get whacked the hardest, right? So if you've got a, um, uh, a family program, you've got a lot of kids, you've got uh, predominantly two parent households there. If you have predominantly college graduates, college graduates get hit the, the last, the lat, but almost all this stuff. Uh, people who dropped out of high school get hit the first. Uh, 20 to 30 year old males get hit the hardest, especially if they don't have a college, uh, education, especially if they don't have an high school education. So even if you look at the employment numbers, think about where the employment numbers were mostly over the last 90 days. They were mostly food service, waiters, waitresses, uh, the cook in the kitchen, et cetera. Um, there were a lot of other companies. Amazon is a notable, um, 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 you know, pinnacle of that. A lot of other companies that were hiring. But if you've got an office job, if you're a blue collar worker, if you're an attorney, if you're a a CPA, docs got hammered uh, quite a bit, so that's an exception to that rule. But if you're a, a, an attorney or you work in an office or you work for Google or you work for Facebook or something, they were working from home on their laptop. It didn't really make much difference. And in fact, a lot of times they were making more money and, um, and frankly not having to work nearly as hard or perhaps having to work harder, but they, they, they had plenty of, of income to go around. The other stat was, I believe it's 55%, 55% of people who had to file unemployment because of this were actually making more from unemployment benefits than they were making on their job, right? And all of that tells you, number one, why I prefer 40-year-old married couple who has a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old as my student and why, I, why I'm not as wild about 23-year-old um, adult male high school dropout who works blue collar. Nothing against the 23-year-old, but I would prefer to have a student there for five years, somebody who's stable and somebody who's really going to be engaged and, and focused. So as far as topical, let's cycle back for a second on retention and what Bob said. If you're one of those instructors who think all of your students love you, that you have great retention and you never need to worry about that because your classes are great, take a look at your active count in February Take a look at your active count right now. And if you're down more than 10%, you were lying to yourself. Master Moody, is that, a, is that a fair statement? Well, it's a fair statement. And I think that some people way overreacted to what you just said, you know, in the, in the opposite way. You, everything you said is all congruent with it. It's all the same topic that you just talked about. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't understand what was really going on in the economy. And because 5% of their students came in and said, hey, I've got, a, I've got a job problem, which is probably about right. You know, it, it, if they had the normal demographics for mo a lot of our martial arts school owners that have kids and, you know, maybe there's 5% that had some sort of financial, sometimes actual problem, sometimes just a worry, they overreacted and they start suspending people's tuition uh, or, or they think the gyms, their gym closed down and they suspended their tuition. So they think, well, I'm like a gym, so now I have to suspend everybody's tuition. Or, and by the, or the worst is their idiot billing company suspended the tuition without cooperating. We had a couple of those. Right, right, right. And, right. and, and the, or they get the stupid advice, like from the industry people that are giving them stupid advice, and they suspended their tuition, so they made a really bad reason. And by the way, suspending the tuition made their, made their retention go down. You know, if you don't make the assumption that everybody's going to keep training – I think what you're what you're saying is you don't you're not showing leadership and 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 continuing to have ninety percent of your students trained. What what our guys all did was was you know say okay good well not good but this happened and so we're going to keep training during this time and if people had a problem they would help them work with it. Yeah. The other the other big problem that happened is uh, some of these knucklehead billing companies. Uh, tried to group in our martial arts schools with the uh, gyms that actually were closed down 
in our martial arts schools that closed down in our group, they continued to thrive because we kept the same schedule going and did the virtual live online classes. And so, and it, were in, it was interactive because we used the Zoom link that we do in our meetings all the time. And uh, they were training these students, doing the testing, doing all the belt presentations, and they did a drive-by to pick up their belts and, and stripes and things. So they really kept business going as usual. And uh, that's why they had such good participation. You know, one of our member schools had over uh, uh, 40 enrollments in, uh, in May. Uh, and that was because we were doing intros. A lot of people thought they couldn't do intros online. We did intros online, gave them uh, some benefit for starting it now because the kids were at home doing nothing. We needed to do something to keep them active and they weren't doing any physical anything. So we, we had them now participate in our program and, uh, and, and gave them a free month for every month we were on virtual. Now, they paid for that month. And if we had to add a month on to the end of the program. Yeah, by, and, yeah, and by the way, that's not the month to month idiocy. We were adding that to the end of their program. And renewing it. Yeah, which was some of them were on a year program. Some were on a four or even a six year program. Yeah. But well, uh, Master the, Smith, making, they kept on training. Yeah. And you're making a good point. The idea behind and what Master Oliver just said is to have 90% or even better retention. In our, in our case, we were 95 or better percent retention over this time it, it if you think about what's really going on as long as you immediately go to be able to teach online classes and and provide service to people what else do they have to do all their other stuff is shut down and further and what we're going to talk about in terms of the comeback is a lot of their stuff still shut down or not operating normally. So we have so much opportunity because we can still provide service in a really good way. We can still keep on working with people in a way that nobody else can. We can still keep doing things. And during all this time, we've continued to do that. I mean, it really was a shift in mindset of, okay, things change and we just need to change with it and then just continue to go on. So you're making a really good point, Grandmaster Smith, is that, that our guys just, went to, okay, well, now how do we enroll people? Now how do we keep training our students? Now how do we keep doing the things that we've been doing before? So therefore, we didn't really lose any, any momentum yeah. for what we got. Yeah, if you have bad retention, let's say you started with 500 students to, to make it an easy number, and you stop doing enrollments, and you're losing 7% a month. Well, I don't like any of those numbers, but if I'm at 500 students, I'm losing 7% a month, that means if I stop doing enrollments, I I'm down 35 in a month. I'm down 70, a little less, in two months. And I'm down 125 in three months just by my normal attrition, if, if that's where you're at. Again, we're targeting 1% to 2% uh, a month retain, uh, attrition. So if I have 500 students, maybe I lose five or six normally, right? But And just to um, clarify that attrition, Master Oliver, our members are in the one to three percent, you know, is the, the, the lowest we ever want them to be. But I'm telling you, that number you use, that seven percent is being yeah. uh, generous because most schools around the country are in the seven to ten percent dropout yeah. uh, and not even tracking it. Yeah, but if that were you, you're going to lose 125 students with 500 active in three months just because you stopped doing enrollments. And what, uh, again, go back to what uh, uh, Bob said to begin with. We want to be very focused on, on, on our topic here. But schools don't prioritize marketing. And even when they are, are focused on it, what they do is they get a little narrow range of things that they do. And what we constantly teach and preach, and I stole this from Jay Abraham, is Parthenon. Have, 20 different things going on all at once. And clearly March, April, May, what happened is some of those pillars imploded. So if I had a lot of programs set up in elementary schools, being able to go to the elementary school, teach there, whether it's a before and after school enrichment program, a uh, PE teacher for the day, you know, whatever it might be, obviously that imploded. However, they became even more receptive to driving those students to, to online programs. So it's not like you couldn't replace that online. 
the other thing is, you know, we like to do big events at movie theaters or big, you know, outdoor events and stuff like that. Well, sure, all that stuff locked up for a while, right? I was looking forward to, my son is looking forward to the uh, uh, Black Widow movie that was supposed to come out in May. Well, number one, it wasn't a marketing opportunity in May. And number two, you know, we can't see it until, uh, until the fall. However, Facebook's engagement went up 650% or 640%. People actually started reading their email. And as, as you guys know, I just have gotten to the point, I hate email, why even bother? But people were reading their email and paying attention. And, and because of remote work and remote school and everything else, that worked great. Co-promotional opportunities, everything from, you know, the pizza place puts a, a, a promotional flyer uh, that's a charitable fundraiser on their pizza box to, um, you know, working with uh, other sports leagues that had to shut down, working with other um, uh, youth organizations, working with churches. I mean, people became so receptive. The other thing is our guys ended up on press all the time. I mean, um, uh, newspaper, uh, which is least powerful, uh, TV, which is most powerful, but constant TV spots showing this, you know, wonderful uh, uh, service in the community. But let's go to right now. We're, we're at uh, mid-June right now. Um, a lot of schools normally think that summer slows down and it's what, you know, of, of us on the, on the meeting here, you know, I'll, I'll freely admit I'm the guy who hates summer camps. Um, and I'll, I'll peg Master Smith as the guy who loves summer camps. And Master, maybe I'll put you in the, in the, the, the middle column. No, I'm on your uh, side. Yeah, you're on my side. There you go. <laughs> uh, but what they think is, they have to do summer camps in order to keep their gross up because the school is going to drop over the summer. Well, as we all know on, on the meeting here, last 10 years, 15 years, we've had July and August be our best enrollment months of the year regularly anyway. And that's because there are so many marketing opportunities that happen over the summer. But I think that, and I don't mean it's going to be worse, I think this summer is different than any summer that I can remember ever in history, because you have the population that's been under essentially house arrest for three months. Activities have been shut down, movie theaters have been shut down, restaurants have been shut down, uh, sports leagues, soccer leagues, uh, adult softball leagues, all of that's been shut down. And it's not like they're essentially getting out of school. School may be done virtually, but there's a whole different transition mindset that's going on right now. I think July and August this year, both because the V-shaped recovery, number one, huge pent up demand to get out of the house and do something. Number three, the incredible value that we can provide if explained. I think this is gonna be the best summer ever in the history of martial arts for the top 20%. And I think the bottom 30 or 40%, if they're not out of business already, are going to be out of business pretty quickly. And for the middle group, it all depends upon whether they get their head on straight and, and realize there's opportunity out there. Um, is that a, a, a fair assessment, guys? Yeah, and I, I think that, I think that it's, it, it's more than fair. And I think that you've got to be looking in the right places. Uh, you know, if you try to just do the same thing, I think for most people that have been spending the last year really not marketing or marketing in one or two things and hoping that those things work. They have a website up and they, what we, what we end up having on the phone and Bob can, Bob can tell us if this is right. What marketing are you doing? Well, I get most of my marketing by word of mouth. Well, that, that's, that's really not marketing at all. That's just kind of waiting around for people to tell other people about you and, and hoping people are going to walk in your door. If, if you're doing that, then this is going to be a pretty rough time. If you're, if you're, getting enough things happening and looking in the right places right now and looking really, that's one reason our guys didn't have as much trouble during this time because they were already doing enough things so that, so that, you know, we had some really big things that, that just got blown up like the movie theater promotions that I think last year we had somebody get 200 appointments uh, for Avengers uh, over yeah. one weekend. And the in, next in, 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 in Manhattan at the AMC in Harlem. And of course, Manhattan has uh, been completely locked down right now. So you, you take that yeah. same that same school, and that he had two hundred one weekend, a hundred the next weekend. So that's three hundred appointments, not not leads, but appointments that turned into probably sixty seventy members. 
Uh, and this year that went away, but he had a bunch of other stuff going on. So I think the, the key break point is, is, are, is there enough marketing going on? And that's usually the, the, that's going to be the, that's going to be the tipping point for a school that's going to do really, really well over this time and have lots of opportunity. And I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be potentially double or triple the opportunity or the results that they would have gotten before. If the school owner was not was kind of waiting for walk-in traffic or waiting for word of mouth, that's probably not going to double or triple. I don't think, I don't think any of that. So if that's kind of what you've been doing and you haven't, you've kind of have your website up and you're really not doing any other kind of AdWords or Facebook, when you're not really doing anything to drive traffic to it and you've been waiting for word of mouth marketing and that's really all you're doing and maybe open, you know, and you, well, and you this, Master Moody, what's not in their way right now. So this time last year, when I was talking to everybody, they were losing the students because they were all on vacations. They were hunkering down because they weren't making any money. Kids were off doing baseball, soccer, football, or hockey. But I mean, so look at what now is not in your way and look at the positive things to really help you expand on. All those people are looking for something to do. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a perfect point. Now that some of them can now go on vacation, but a lot of them aren't. Nope. So, so even though they can go on vacation, a lot of them just don't want to. They're staying home. And if you're offering online classes, it's perfect for them. Um, and, and, uh, 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 and exactly what you said, the baseball, soccer, summer camps, a lot of those other things are blown up. And a lot right. of our kids are working with the summer camps that exist to get a lot of those people in because the summer camps are all reformatting. A further thing I think that's happening is all the, all the groups that we'd like to work with and build some relationship with schools and summer camps and churches and those kind of groups that maybe you've tried to work with over the years, now their whole world's been blown up and now it might be easier, our, our guys are finding out it is easier to work with those kind of groups. So there's so many opportunities we didn't have at all before. So it, it, the, the thinking is totally backwards. I think the thinking for some people is, oh, everything's bad. I can only do a little bit. And it's very much the opposite. Everything's opened up a lot more and the results in some areas are gonna be double. Yeah. Admittedly, some things are not gonna work like movie theater promotions because the movie theaters ain't open. Some things aren't going to work. We, we understand that, but there's a lot of things that can work and will be a lot more productive. Yeah, even with that, almost everywhere in the country, Mulan is going to open in July still. Uh, uh, late July, Wonder Woman is going to open in August. Uh, most of the other big summer and spring blockbusters got pulled to uh, uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas. So Black Widow, as I mentioned before, and some of those others. Uh, but what you, what you have right now is, let, if we start with an objective, my objective would be, okay, we've got two things. We've got the students that we let fall apart. And we've got to go back, not just for the last three months, but let's say for the last 12 or 18 months, and get them back engaged. And clearly, recency makes it easier. So May getting people back from May is easier than getting people back from a year and a half ago. But we want to you know, go back and re-engage those people. There's no better time right now. Number two is it's time to put together the plan the marketing plan, the advertising plan, the promotional plan, however you want to think about it, and have June 15th, which I know is past, but June 15th to the end of July be, we're going to add 100 new students. And then flip it back around and have a huge back to school session as well. And I was going to add on to what you said, just as a small highlight, that, that re-engaging people from a year ago historically hasn't been super easy. This is the easiest time ever to do that. Because the last three months for sure. Left, yeah, all the stuff they left you for, if they left you for baseball, there ain't no more baseball. You know, I mean, this is the easiest time ever we're finding that is the easiest time ever to do that. So, you know, don't, you, we're, don't put your blinders on to those kind of things. We're finding these are much easier times to do that. And I know we're going to get into enrollments later. I, I want to quickly, we had one of our, one of our members, Paul Pendergast, he was, he was telling me, he was, we were, he was telling the group, that he was in the group of all the people that he works with in his city, in his area, in his state. And he was the only one of the other people that we used around that was doing enrollments. All the rest of the people were, were surprised. All this stuff, all this stuff will work and they will, the enrollment rates are even higher, but I don't, we're going to get into that later in terms well, of. Well, and, 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 and don't leave it at that. What Paul, when Paul was saying was they all assumed, well, what are you doing? Two week virtual program, a three week virtual at program. Lower price. Yeah. 
a low price. It's a, no, no. He he was doing, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, four ninety seven down, uh, uh, two forty seven a month, a twelve month enrollment, standard enrollment, and standard enrollment with they do classes by Zoom. And when they reopen the the school, they're going to be able to do Zoom, or they're going to be able to do in house at the at the school, and you know uh, choose back and forth. Um, Master you know, Oliver, go ahead. Fund that with the confusion, I believe, with most of the guys that I speak with too, is that this is different. Therefore, I must do something different. So that and our guys, as you know, are not. Everything's the same. You're teaching the same classes. You're enrolling the same way. But for some reason, because this thing is different, they believe that they now have to do something different with the school. Oh, very good point. Very good point. Yeah, they, 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 well, most of them, not, not our guys, but most schools <laughs> didn't even think they could still do normal enrollments. Right. right? Um, and then they thought, well, marketing, and, and they already, uh, many people already thought, well, advertising doesn't work. Well, that's just dumbass to begin with. Anyone who, who tells you advertising doesn't work, doesn't know how to do advertising properly. But, uh, the, the reality is, one is first priority was to keep your entire student body intact. Two, it was to at least do enough enrollments that the ones you lost, you replaced, preferably to grow. And then three, it was to keep all the same progress updates, all the same testing pro progress, all the same renewal processes in place, and to do as much cash in, in March, April, May, um, normal, as you normally did, right? So, you know, initial tuition, down payments, uh, paid in fulls, all of that, to not let that slip. So, again, those who did it poorly dropped 50% or dropped 40% or dropped 25%. Those who, who, who did it well stayed even, even, even jumped a little bit. And honestly, an awful lot of good schools were down maybe 10, 15% because maybe they were good at retention and they were good at um, continuing enrollments, but they didn't keep the renewal flow on, on time because uh, admittedly, it's a lot of hard work. Um, going back to when this thing kicked in is Matt Smith, you and I, and, and uh, um, uh, well, all four of us have talked to an awful lot of schools who are sharp, normally great operators who do big numbers, who just didn't know how to react uh, to this properly. Here's, here's another one from the, uh, uh, from the magazine I pulled out that I was just chagrined. And this is on the other end of the spectrum, by the way, but the comment was, we immediately set up all of our students for two private lessons a week and immediately redid our class schedule. So instead of being our normal schedule, uh, they each had 30 minute classes that they could do as a group in addition to their, uh, their short 10 or 15 minute private lessons that we did twice a week. Well, you know, if I've got 300 students and now I'm trying to, uh, or 500 or you know, 200, whatever it is, and now I'm trying to schedule them twice a week for private lessons, and then do uh, uh, group classes. And then I completely changed the class schedule, which as you know, anytime, if you normally change the class schedule and shuffle everything around, there's massive confusion anyway, right? But if, if all of a sudden you do that in a, in a context that they're not even physically coming to the school and you didn't have a chance to talk to them personally and they're a little wigged out with everything going on, it's a disaster, right? Um, so talk about, you know, bad advice, um, but let's move, move forward. So just right to clarify, now, just to clarify how they were doing that, Master Oliver, it wasn't like this webinar we're doing where we only see ourselves. They actually saw all their students. It was a, uh, a, a gallery view. So they had it on a big screen in the school. They could see everybody. They could correct them. They well, sure, that's the, that, that's the Zoom classes for students. Correct. What I was referring to as bad advice from the trade industry magazine was setting all of your students up for two private lessons a week. Exactly. I mean, so just, we had them in their regular classes yeah, and we yeah. were able to interact with them. And, and now they got a chance to see their instructors. Some of them drove by to pick up their new belt for testing and all kinds of systems. The same way they would go by a drive-in uh, yeah. Chick-fil-A and pick up an order. They were doing that at the school. Everybody was comfortable with, the, you know, those kind of uh, contacts. Yeah. And uh, so the, the key was, and, and you mentioned another thing that I, I want to make sure that everybody doesn't misconstrue. 
when you said paid in fulls and and we didn't go in trying to push paid in full off the new people enrolling the, you know we leave the new enrollments to their normal billing but when they upgrade or renew to a, a black belt program and beyond now those are worth more so those are the ones that we might go back to after they've already signed up well and, to, to clarify yeah. what, what i was saying mass smith is if i normally have pick a number if I normally have 60,000 a month at one school in billing, and I normally do another 40,000 in-house, and that's obviously a, you know, a good school, right? A $100,000 a month school. Hey, that's if they, most schools, most schools yeah. aren't doing those numbers. So when no, they- I know, I know, I know, but, but the point is, if they were normally doing that, if that was a normal month, and then they just stopped doing payments, paid in fulls, all that stuff, and their billing stayed the same. They dropped forty thousand uh, a month just because they were so busy, you know, uh, um, trying to keep their students. And, and by the way, I talked to—I uh, won't say who—but a, a couple of um, uh, uh, friends at, at different billing companies, and they were saying the problem with martial arts schools is they didn't even want to talk to their students. Is they were just hoping the billing was still going to hit, and didn't even want to call their students. And, uh, and tell them what was going on. And as we know, first thing we did is priority mail, mail to them all, 29 emails, 15 text messages, live person calling them, uh, maintaining the complete schedule. Here's the Zoom link, here's how you log in. Uh, if you need some extra support, let us know and we'll do some, uh, some make lessons and so forth. Keeping the ID cards and the attendance up to date so we knew who was there. Uh, an awful lot of schools that I talk to that we're not working with, they don't even know who their active students are now. Yeah, everything the same except for just the, it was on Zoom. Or yeah. everything the same except for we added some value. Like, you know, in our case, we added on-demand classes. So the classes were all also recorded so they could get them on demand. Or we added an addition, like in my case, I recorded some life skill videos yeah. that I did in addition because I don't teach every day at the school. So I added, so there were added value, but not taken away. So that now when the transition's back to uh, partial in-house in and partial or in-person and partial out, uh, that some of the students are still doing online, that's fine. Everything's a very smooth transition. But also the same thing was happening. Uh, what, it, what you're saying is we were still doing enrollments. We're still doing marketing. We're still doing renewals or upgrades, if, if you're calling it that. We're still doing all the other things that we're doing in the school so that we still make the same amount of money so the students still come and train. If a student has a problem and they lost their job, we deal with it on an individual basis. Nobody was panicking because it's all the same. I yeah. think that's the, the big difference is this, is this panic because it's a big deal. I mean, the coronavirus pandemic is a big deal. It's bizarre, yeah. Bizarre. yeah it's, it's something nobody's seen, we, none of us have seen in our lifetime. So it's understandable to, to respond and react, but, did, but it didn't need to be that kind of response. What we needed to do is adjust appropriately our guys adjusted appropriately. We had a lot of our guys stay right about at the same income or pretty, pretty close. Maybe they, our guys had to adjust too for a little bit, but yeah, you know, so that we're down a little bit, but not, you know, not 50%. And we have classes, we have schools all over the country, uh, you know, all over the U S all over Canada, even UK. And uh, so different areas were opening or reopening or not opening in different times. Some were closing in different times. So even the ones that are now doing partial reopenings, we're still doing the online classes, but now we also have an opportunity for them to do in the school. Some of them are doing outdoors. You know, they have a, a big lot in front of their school or a park nearby that haven't let them come into the school. So we have all kinds of other live things that you can do uh, during this. It, it, you know, even if your area is completely shut down, you know, outdoors, you can go to a park and have the social distancing with the mask and, and still run classes there. So we were giving them a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, selections on how to keep things moving forward and positive for their students. And that was the, uh, the main thing for our group is the reason they all uh, kept their gross up. Yeah, I was, I was having, we have a, we have a, a member who uh, uh, does about 7 million a year. Um, and they just came back. He, he had, uh, he had left a few years ago and then connected, I think on this last webinar we did and then came back and we, we were going through his numbers and I said, Oh, you know, 
don't, don't you know, I'm, I'm not trying to pour salt in the wound, but we would have saved you about $4 million uh, by having done this differently. And, you know, what happens out there is it's very easy to feel like you know what's going on and you, uh, you know, I, well, I know how to market and I know about Facebook and I know about events and I know about mail and all that stuff and I know how to price and I know how to do all that stuff. But then what happens is the further you get away from having a coach, a mentor, and a powerful peer group of successful schools, the harder it is to adjust to transitions. And as you were saying, um, Mass Moody, is uh, uh, Paul Pendergast's statement was, you know, if he hadn't been part of this group, he wouldn't have known how to, uh, how to transition as smoothly. People, he's a very smart guy, you know, a million plus a, a, a year, very high net. But even there, adjusting without seeing what the other people on the team who are all top one percenters or maybe five percenters, uh, what they're doing, getting some coaching by, you know, uh, people who've been around at this for a long, 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 long time and getting that support without doing that. And, and it's, you know, the, 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 the trite and, you know, true line is you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting. I think of it differently as there's no such thing as a plateau. So once you get everything where it's really cranking along well, that's when it all starts to disintegrate. Uh, ask me, I forget who really said it. I, 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 I was attributing it to Hawking forever, and then I finally looked up the quote. But it's all systems left to on their own tend towards entropy. And then when you put a disaster like this in the middle of it, it's not entropy, meaning slow degradation. It's just it all blows up in your face, right? So that's, you know, if there's no other key, it's that what I learned years ago, because I was in essentially, if you want to call it the mastermind group with Jeff Smith and June Ree and um, um, Nick Kokinas and, you know, very, very smart people. And then the next level of that was Jeff Smith, but then also Steve LaValle and, uh, uh, you know, many other very, very smart, smart people on a regular basis. And then uh, you know, with Jay Abraham and Dan Kennedy and, and a bunch of other people outside the industry as well. But if you're not constantly surrounding yourself with other people who are doing better than you are, with people who are smarter than you are, and with people who are constantly educating themselves in other ways different than what you're self-educating, it's really easy for something like this to blow you sideways. Master Smith, how many conversations have we had with people who have, what, even 50 locations? who adopted really badly to this thing. And um, um, I got to take pressing online, you know, is, you know, 15 locations talking about filing bankruptcy, uh, 40 locations and all of their, you know, curriculum was putting videos on, uh, on YouTube and, uh, you know, lost 50% of the students thinking that was good. Uh, you know, we can go on and on and on. And, and, and one on. of the reasons why you did this webinar, and, and this isn't the first webinar we've done, uh, you know, we did them back when we were first getting into this to kind of save some of our friends and some of our martial arts schools because we're part of the industry. So we want to help our industry. So that's why we put these free webinars on to let people know that there is stuff you can do. These are some of the steps you should be doing because there was a lot of schools that just didn't know what to do. Their peer group, whoever they were uh, in, in uh, uh, contact with, didn't know what to do either. So they were all kind of left there, uh, just gonna try something and they didn't have any system that was working. So that's why uh, it's, it's not what happens during this kind of situation. It's how you react to it and what you do when it happens. These things happen, you know, in our 50 year period, there are almost 50 years of running schools there's been all kinds of ups and downs in the economy or the market and things that happened. And you have to be prepared and, and know how to react to those kind of things. And there's a lot of schools that don't. I talked to a, a new school owner yesterday. He's not a new one. He had uh, four schools and uh, he had uh, 600 students and which is not real, uh, I consider real successful, but he was down to 300 active. You know, they were doing about 60000 a month, and now they're doing uh, 30000 between the four schools. Well, 30000 is like the low end on one of our single schools, and he's got four. So it's just because they didn't know what to do. 
Yeah. yeah, and and I think when you look at what really happened, it's it's just a microcosm of the stuff that we've seen over these last many years. It just happened all at once for everybody. So the, I think what you said is react, but I think what what's been a lot of this is overreact. And I think what's made us kind of very frustrated, uh, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think I can, is seeing some of the bad advice that we've seen spouted around in the industry that we're trying to really get. It, it, it's been such bad advice. And you said that from the trade journal, uh, you know, we're assuming that you suspended your, uh, your, uh, your tuition for everybody. And that's just the worst thing that you could ever do. Um, you're automatically going to lose your student. I mean, if you, if we suspend tuition, they're going to stop training. I mean, then, now you've got a retention problem because you suspended tuition. It, it, it's, it's idiotic for so many reasons. Uh, I mean, it's just so bad what we see in the industry and the bad advice that people get. And Master Oliver, you call it the bozo explosion of consultants in the industry. And and that's something that really, it, it's not because we're trying to help people in that space as much as we know that it's giving, it's negligent, it's giving people, it's putting people in the wrong direction. And this is one where it's tipped people over the over the cliff in a lot of cases. Well, and, and, and you know, the bozo explosion is designed to be all of the morons who suddenly, you know, they're a flash in the pan or, you know, maybe they know how to do Facebook advertising or they know how to do SEO and suddenly they're an expert on that, on, on all things. And, and even those people, I mean, we've got, we've got Mass Moody, you know, we have on tap the best website designers and SEO and, and uh, pay-per-click people, the best Facebook people. But really what you have to do is have the people pull all that together and convert leads to intros to enrollments, to renewals, retention, all that stuff. But, you know, in, in, uh, in this book, which probably a bunch of people on the webinar have, I think I wrote this in 99 or 2000 or something like this, is there's a chapter in here called It's Never As Bad As You Think It Is. And that is exactly the mindset from the, the last 90 days is people thought, oh, it's Armageddon. The world is going to end. Matt Smith, we, 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 we joke about it. We had one of our clients we were talking to and he's, you know, lily pads and you double the lilies and all of a sudden it covers the entire pond and 3 million people are going to die. And, you know, people were in a panic talking to me about, and, and my picture was it's Will Smith on Fifth Avenue with tumbleweeds and the mutant dog, whatever that movie was. I am legend. Yeah, I am legend, right? There was, there was two groups of people. There were those that didn't do anything because they didn't know what to do. And then there was other people that were doing stuff that was ridiculous that, that we know that doesn't work. You know? So that's why it's so critical to have a, a peer group or get some advice from somebody who is actually doing it uh, and doing it during this pandemic because there might have been people that were doing a pretty good job before this pandemic that didn't know what to do once it hit. So. Uh, you know, and, and the, the best, you know, best advice we could give them was uh, keep your same schedule, get all those people. And the marketing we did was a lot different. There was a lot of systems that worked so much better during this pandemic that didn't work as well before. And knowing what those are is critical. Well, and right now, and we're going to run out of time as always before we get through 75% uh, of our, our material. Let me, let me, let everybody know there's a chat box here on the thing, which I have a hard time both seeing, you know, because I've got these big ass monitors that are, you know, uh, uh, on my desk. But um, uh, also is I put Bob Dunn's phone number in there. If you have any questions at all and need some support, uh, give Bob a call and we're happy to talk to you. We're happy to give you some, some thoughts and some advice. Don't expect it to be sugar-coated. Don't expect us to reinforce your, your, uh, uh, your excuses. And, and by the way, your area isn't any different than anybody else. What we, what we know is as far as when businesses are opening, everywhere in the world, but um, you know, certainly North America, it's, it's a dimmer switch. Things are kind of gradually coming back to normal. And then they may go gradually back to the shutdown stuff. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's probably going to be slower on either coast than it is if you're in uh, Montana or something like that. But everybody is dealing with the same issues, the same level of emotional concerns. 
uh, for students. I did a checklist, and we're happy to give this away, um, a checklist on the, on the gradual wheat reopening, a checklist, uh, the, uh, the first one was seven pages, the second one was three pages, I think, a checklist on thriving during the shutdown, a checklist on thriving during the gradual reopening. What I, what I will say before we run out of time is, um, one is what we're doing for our members is the grand reopening marketing plan to add 100 new students. And expecting and planning for this to be our best summer ever, and I don't mean because of summer camps, but I mean because of enrolling normal, real students. Plus, there's all kinds of opportunities with summer camps and stuff. The second thing is we're putting together a real plan to re resuscitate anybody that was allowed to fall apart. And I mean allowed because it's your fault if, if they fell apart during this thing, right? And number three is we've been doing a massive renewal blitz. And I look at it this way. Any business that you didn't do in March, April, May is just sitting there as pent up demand. Any renewals you didn't do in March, April, May should all be done in June. Any in, uh, intros that you had come in that you didn't enroll, it's time to enroll them. And what we've been having, not only has it not been slow from a standpoint of intros, is we have a lot of our schools that are just overwhelmed with traffic, having trouble keeping up with it all. And that's going to, I think, double or triple in the coming weeks. So again, depending upon where you're at, I see upstate New York and Florida and uh, just the people that I... That I, that I know here. You know, if you're in Manhattan, it'll be a little bit slower than if you're in uh, um, uh, Dallas, Texas. And if you're in um, uh, downtown Seattle, it'll probably be a little slower opening than, uh, uh, than it is maybe here in Colorado. But it's either gonna be, you know, a little bit slower, a little bit faster than, than other schools. It just doesn't matter. Uh, we're gonna keep the virtual classes going for the rest of the year. We're going to have it be the dimmer switch gets a little bit brighter, maybe it dials back a little bit, then it goes up. We're gonna have it be hyper safe, but we're gonna go balls to the wall on marketing on everything possible. And that's direct mail and that's Facebook advertising. Master Moody, as we've been talking, you know, Google search engine, all that stuff. Well, there weren't many parents out in April looking for martial arts lessons for their, uh, their kid because they assumed everything was shut down. But as things start opening, there's, that's going to be skyrocketing, right? And exactly. again, there's three months of pent-up demand. There's ones who are thinking about in March, April, May, who suddenly in June or July or August, as soon as your area is aware, like I'm here in Colorado, the swimming pools aren't open yet. The movie theaters aren't open yet. The theaters are open at 50% capacity. Our schools are open. I'm not even sure it's legal, but I don't really care. I'd rather ask you know, forgiveness and permission. Uh, but still we're operating at about 50% capacity in, in the various classes and doing all the, the safety requirements. But this is the best time in history to me to fill your school up. And you've got the entire population has been under house arrest uh, for three months essentially and is looking and, and I mean, Jeff, you were laughing, but you know, me and my 12 year old, we drove from Denver all the way up to, um, um, where the hell was it, um, um, Avon, which is right outside of uh, uh, Vail, to go to a, a drive-in movie. Hour and we got it. One what? way. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. And, and, uh, and stayed the night to go to a drive-in movie. It was Back to the Future. And the drive-in movie ended up being this big blow-up screen in the middle of a parking lot behind a, uh, a cemetery. And you drove in and they gave you a can of Coke and they gave you a bag of of, uh, of popcorn, but it's just, we were just so bored looking for something to do, you know, because all of our normal activities, which is, you know, two movies a week and 12 restaurants a week, seconds probably an exaggeration. Master, Master Oliver, uh, I have to jump off. I have another yeah. uh, call I have to do, but I just wanted to remind everybody, if they'll give Bob a call, I know you put it on the, the, uh, the notes here for everybody, but it's 720 two five six oh two oh eight for Bob Dunn's number seven two oh two five six oh two oh eight if you'll give him a call uh, he'd be glad to set up a time you know for you guys jumping on here with us today a lot of people are going to see this on replay too but for you guys that came on live we're actually going to uh, do a one-on-one -on -one call with you guys and actually listen to 
what your concerns are and see if we can help you uh, get through this personally. So, uh, you know, we'll take a half hour, 20 minutes of our time to go through uh, something that'll help you specifically. Uh, if you just give Bob Dunn a call, again, 720-256-028. Okay? Yeah, and, 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 and do that. Also, you can go to uh, martialartstimulus.com and you're going to get everything that we've done during this whole um, uh, Corona thing, uh, the replays of the live, of the webinars, uh, replays of internal uh, members only meetings uh, on, on various topics on thriving during this, the checklist on the gradual reopenings, the checklist on operating during shutdown. You're going to get all of that stuff. Um, and uh, I see a lot of familiar names. So a lot of you guys have my books and you have all those videos and so forth. But this is everything we've done to keep people on track and accelerate their progress during this time. And now we're making that shift. And again, you know, Georgia is more or less back to normal and New York isn't yet and Jersey or whatever. But it's now that shift where it's gradually coming back. And I gotta tell you, I'm absolutely convinced, number one, that's not a fluke. The job numbers aren't a fluke is everything's going to come roaring back. There is massive pent up demand. There is urgency for exciting things to do. Parents are desperate for something to help reinstill discipline and help their child become focused because to a great extent, the virtual learning that I'm, I mean, the virtual learning that martial arts schools did was 10 times better than the virtual learning that my son's sixth grade class did. Um, you know, some may have adapted well, you know, Jefferson County, Colorado did not adapt well, I got to <laughs> tell you that. And, and so, Master Oliver, some people were, you know, even, you know, why are you guys sharing all this information with everybody free? It's because we want to help our industry. We don't want 50% of our schools closing because that actually hurts the other good schools because people are hesitant to, to, to go in because they say, oh, we got burn at this other school, so we don't want to sign a a program up with you guys now because we'll get stuck again. So uh, it's it's just to help our industry, but help you personally. Call Bob Dunn. He put his number there at the bottom of his picture there on the screen. So uh, give him a call. He'll help you get that information free. He'll help you set up a time to talk with me uh, uh, and and or Master Oliver. So uh, do that. I'm going to have to jump jump off. Yeah, we're all, we're we're all going to have to do that because we're triple booked for the day. Bob, yeah. you, actually, you you overlap me three times today, I think. Yeah, so and, I, and I, I, have four. I would tell everybody, stop looking around and listening to extra advice. I mean, you know, it's not that I don't want to act like we're the only ones that can tell you what to do, but uh, but there's a lot of really bad advice. The worst thing you can do is say, well, you know what? I want to look at this. I want to look and see what everybody's doing and then try to figure it out myself. Yeah, we, we have almost 100 schools that we're working with, and they are – you know, 95% of them are doing as good or better than they were doing before. Yeah, Matt Smith, you've got to run. But okay. I'll say, you know, the PPP program has been extended and then and, and they and enhanced that a little bit in the SBA thing. But if you're worrying about and having to rely on that, and fine, go go apply for it. I'm I'm in favor if, the, if our government's showing, throwing away uh, or throwing around, I won't say throwing away, but throwing around trillions of dollars, you know, go scoop but don't rely on that as your savior. You know, I see otherwise smart martial artists stressing out about filing unemployment or I'm a 1099, what do I do? Or, you know, I, I had, you know, the PPP, I haven't been able to get the PPP thing. Who cares? Forget about all of that stuff. Run your business well. There's plenty of opportunity. And now is the time to thrive. And again, there, I mean, we could have, we, we can go through the 100, add 100 students marketing plan, the sales process, the gradual reopening. A uh, bunch of that is we're happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one and, and do that. Give Bob Dunn a call and go to that martialartstimulus.com and you'll get all, the, all of the materials that we've done so far on helping schools both thrive during shutdowns and, and thrive during the gradual reopenings. We'll keep updating that as well. Thank you, Master Moody. And thank you, thank you Mr. Dunn. And I'm going to see you both again four times today or some ridiculous amount of time. <laughs> All right. Okay. See you soon.